Do you have a deal that you can share with us in terms of purchase price, what you pay for a down payment, your renovation, your income and expenses? It was a five bed, five bath, 4,800 square feet home for $490,000 here in Arizona. We put about 100K in renovation and we also had about 60K of carrying and startup costs. I always recommend people have at least two times their monthly expenses in carrying costs because you are not going to be full day one. We actually added two bathrooms, four bedrooms. So it's a nine, seven now. We actually even filled in the pool. So that home brings in rates of about $5,000 per resident. So there's 10 residents in the home, 50,000 coming in every month, expenses on that right around 30. And our debt service on that one is about seven. So that home is bringing us in right about $13,000 income there every month. Your goal is always to retain 20 to 30% of gross income. What does senior living and assisted living even mean? Like what, what are different types of strategy within this niche? We focus on residential homes in single family neighborhoods. When I say that, I don't mean a three bed, two bath. I mean, luxury upscale neighborhoods that have 300 to 500 square feet per resident. In our homes here in Arizona, we are limited to 10 residents in a home. But with 10 residents, our homes are 10 bed, 10 bath homes. Minimum, our smallest home is a little over 3,000 square feet with that 300 to 500 square feet rule. And our larger home is about 6,000 square feet. So they're big homes, definitely, but they're not crazy outlandish 20,000 square feet home. You said you need an administrator, you need a licensed caregiver. Would those be sort of your most expensive folks on the payroll? Those are the people that you are spending the most money on because caregivers, you're usually having a four to one or five to one ratio. They're typically paid minimum wage plus a couple dollars an hour. It definitely ranges from about 12 to $30 an hour, depending on where you live and what the rates are in your area. But two to three on in the day, one to two on at night. And then your administrator is a shared expense if you have multiple homes. If you only have one home, you're not paying them as much because it's not full time for them to oversee one home. How are you looking for these roles for the administrators and caretakers? We're actually seeing a lot of community colleges adding administration for care homes into their curriculum. So there will be some community colleges that you'll be able to put your home on a list of like, hey, when they graduate, give us a call. Like we're always looking for amazing new people. And so you may have an internship program that you want to set up where they come work with you, you know, at a certain pay rate, right? And they're getting experience and you also can go to different online ventures like Indeed, LinkedIn, Craigslist, all these different places. And then there's even more niche ways to go about this. Here in Arizona, majority of our caregivers are Romanian or from the Philippines. We find a lot of people find us through targeted ads in the local Romanian or Filipino newspaper. We say that we're looking for a caregiver and this is what we're paying. This is the location. They'll reach out to us. Okay, welcome to another episode of Affordable Housing and Real Estate Investing. Today, we have Isabel Gravino, who has been esteemed guest on the Wealthy Way podcast, on the Bigger Pockets podcast. And I decided to bring her on today because she brings a wealth of experience and there is no fluff in any of the conversation that I've ever listened to her. So it is an honor. It's a privilege. Isabel, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Doing wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Well, I'm super excited and super grateful for you volunteering your time with your growing family and everything. I know your time is so precious. So thank you so much for coming on, first and foremost. Really, really appreciate it. You got it. Well, it's about, I first heard your story and it was really moving and it was really cool how you got into this residential assisted living space. Could you Tell a little bit about your story and how did you even get into the space for your audience? Yeah, actually, it started with my own grandmother, right? She fell, broke her hip, and the doctors called and said she needs 24-7 care. She needs help with her activities of daily living. She cannot go home alone. Um, and so my family was faced with a situation where it was like, uh-oh, what do you do? You know, when a loved one in your life needs senior housing, it's not something that you're saying, oh, we're looking at this six months down the line. It's an immediate need and you have to start making decisions now. 
So my dad had been a real estate investor for 40 years prior to this and, you know, really just started looking at different options. And we toured a ton of facilities in upstate New York where she was living at the time, found nothing suitable, like everything smelled bad. The food was bad. It was expensive. It had waiting lists. We were just disgusted by everything. And we knew there had to be something better. So we went back to Arizona where we were living at the time and we kind of stumbled into residential assisted living and realized really quick, we're going to be paying five grand a month for her to be living in this home, or we could own the real estate, own the business. We could be cash flowing 10 grand a month and she could live for free. It seemed like a very obvious answer for us to get started in this. And so even though we had no idea what we were doing, we were like, we've got to you know, jump in. So my dad purchased a business and the real estate. It was already up and running residential assisted living with the intent to move her in. She actually passed before we could move her in, but we really fell in love with the industry. And I started work working with my dad shortly after that, really just learning all the ins and outs of this through trial and error. And now we teach people how to do this and learn from our mistakes. But in the beginning, there was a lot of mistakes. <laughs> I absolutely love that story because you and your family took action even when you didn't know what was going on. And I think this is such yeah. an important point for audience to take apart where your why needs to be greater than the amount of work that you are about to endure because there is a lot of unknowns. But now we have Isabel who's going to come <laughs> on and pull back the curtains a little bit so you guys can feel a little bit less afraid. But Isabel, let's let's set the stage a little bit more. Let's give a little bit more more background on what does senior living and assisted living even mean? Like what, what are different types of strategy within this niche? Yeah. So most of people think of a big box facility, a Brookdale Sunrise Atrium with, you know, 100, 300 units. That is not what we do. We're like the antithesis of that. We focus on residential homes in single family neighborhoods. When I say that, I don't mean a three bed, two bath. I mean luxury upscale neighborhoods that have 300 to 500 square feet per resident. And most of your residents are going to want private bedrooms and private bathrooms because that's what they get at the big box. So in our homes here in Arizona, we are limited to 10 residents in a home. Depending on where you are across the country, you're going to be allowed to have somewhere between six and 16 residents in the home. But with 10 residents, our homes are 10 bed, 10 bath homes. Minimum, our smallest home is a little over 3,000 square feet with that 300 to 500 square feet rule. And our larger home is about 6,000 square feet. So they're big homes, definitely, but they're not crazy outlandish 20,000 square feet homes. You know, um, they're still in regular neighborhoods. Next door is mom, dad, two kids and a dog. Um, they're just in luxury upscale parts of town. Wow. That's really interesting. So huge, spacious rooms. So people are living there. They might think it's assisted living, but they're definitely treated with, with respect, with dignity. And most of all, they're in a very, very beautiful home, like you said, luxurious. Yes. Well, what are the differences between like assisted living then and senior living? And how do the different rental rates differ be, depending on the services that you're offering? I'm assuming there's level of differences in services. Yes. So it's going to be heavily based when you need assisted living, it's going to be heavily based on location. There's a ceiling of what you can charge in every location. So in certain parts of town, it's going to be less in other parts of town, it's going to be more it's based on cost of living, because you have to think the cost of the real estate and the renovation and the wages in those areas is going to vary. So Oklahoma is going to be different than New York all day long, right? But then it's also based on the level of care. There's really three components. So location, level of care. So if you need memory care, that's going to cost you an additional up to $1,500 more per month. Um, if you have a, a very high need, right? You're deaf, blind, 500 pounds, you need a two-person assist, that's going to cost you more. If you are just little 85-pound you know, grandma who forgets to take her medications every Tuesday, it will probably be a little bit less. The acuity goes up and down. So location, level of care, and the last one is your physical setup within the house. 
Is it a private bedroom with a private bath? Is it a private bedroom shared bath or shared shared? All of those different rooms within the same home or facility are going to have different rates. So within one facility, you may have someone paying $10,000 a month and someone paying $3,000 a month. And majority of your people are paying somewhere between six and seven, but it ranges based on all three of those different things. Wow. I didn't know it. There's, there could be such a big range just within the same facility. That's yeah. really interesting. And that can make underwriting a little bit, little bit difficult too, when you're trying to make assumptions and trying to figure out whether or not you can get the financing to build it. Where can people do research on understanding what is the spectrum of income or gross revenue that's available? How would they go about it? You can find the cost of care in your area by going to genworth.com forward slash cost of care. You can type in wherever you live or wherever you're, you're thinking about investing and it will pop up with the average rates in your area. And then that will really help you determine you know, what is typically happening in this area. You need to consider this is including everyone who's on government funding, as well as our private pay friends. So it's giving us the average, like the US average is $4,500 per month. But I talk to people every single day who are saying, well, my government funding only pays $1,800 a month and that's what my home accepts. And I talk to other people who laugh in my face when I say 4,500 and they're like, I'm paying 12 grand for my grandma. So it's all over the place. No matter what Genworth says, just know that is the average. So you're really going to have to do your research to tour the homes nearby, find out exactly what amenities they're offering, what the situation is, and then it's going to depend on you personally with that level of care. As far as financing goes, you're going to use some form of an average number. So like we said in that example, if someone's paying 10, someone's paying three, those are very high and low end. We're probably going to run your numbers with averages of five and six just to be safe. Wow. That is a great, I, and I loved your tip about actually touring other homes to do the research because sometimes oh. folks might just get a little lazy. They just say they want to do some quick phone calls, but if you don't understand what your competition is doing, which facts, they are your competition, how would you have the confidence to pitch a deal to somebody or even convince yourself that it's a good deal, right? <laughs> Yeah. And the, the thing is, is someone can say on the phone, oh, our rates start at 3,500. Okay. But then you get in the door and it's actually 7,000, 8,000 out the door. And so it doesn't really matter what they say on the phone. Also, if they say it's 3,500 and it genuinely is, and that's all they're charging. Okay. But are they eating rice and beans every day? Do they have a hair salon and a movie theater? And how many caregivers are there during the day? Like is the activity on Friday folding laundry or is it a, a professional band coming over to play for them like what what are we getting for that price range so going over seeing experiencing that's going to be your best way to be able to co contrast and compare i love that you just went a little bit deeper because a lot of people might have stopped at a phone call you're so correct on that when i do underwriting for multifamily deals i call up other apartments and I say hey what do you have for occupancy but i never truly ask for all the amenities. I love that <laughs> point, Isabel. There you go. Well, I know that Medicare and Medicaid sometimes provide some sort of subsidies. How does that compare? I, I mean, you just talked about the rates at for four thousand, five thousand, ten, twelve thousand. How does that how do the government subsidies compare to what you're seeing in the private space? If you're gonna be relying solely on government funding to care for you towards the end of life, they'll pay out about $1,800 per month. So there are homes that will accept that. There are facilities that will accept that, not many. And you are getting the you know quality level that $1,800 can afford, which is not very much. So when you go into those homes, you may have one caregiver in a facility, you may have one to 40 ratio. In a small home, you may have one to 10. You know, it's it's not going to be steak and lobster for dinner. I'll tell you that. There's probably no activities. It's probably all shared bedrooms because they can't make the bottom line meet. And in our uh, business, residential assisted living, there are a lot of people who go into this heart, heart, heart. They just want to serve seniors. They want to help people. And so, you know, this is what they do. They open up their home to have other people, you know, come there and they're like, I'm going to take care of them myself. Okay, that's amazing. But if you're losing money for this, it's not a business. It's a job. And that is you 
I firmly believe you can't help anyone unless you have something to give them, right? It's do good, do well. And if I don't have any money, how can I help you, right? There, there has to be something that you can give. Uh, and so I think that's tough. You have to have that balance. I completely agree with you. And I think if you are able to find those win-win-win solutions for your investors, your residents, and yourself, I think that's truly the scenario that you should be aiming for because you need resources to help others. See, everybody loves to say, oh, what do you want to do? They just say, I just want to help people. Well, who do you want to help and how do you want to help them? Mm -hmm. And I continue to go back to your story as about you helping out your family members first and how you kind of got into this niche is for folks out there, listeners out there right now, if you have an elderly parent or an aging parent and you're starting to think about what the costs are to support your elderly parent as they age, this is a very, very real scenario where mm -hmm. if you want them to have the best quality of life and be in a residence where it's four, five, 10, 12 grand, well, you might have a heart to go help less fortunate folks, but you now know the difference in ranges. 1800 bucks from, from the government, you need to figure out how you're going to fill the gap and mm -hmm. cover your expenses and your debt. So please pay attention to what Isabel is saying because this is now your responsibility because you, now you're equipped with the information, you got to take action on it and figure out what your scenario is. Yep. And most facilities or homes that accept government funding, that's typically what they're accepting. The private pay homes will not accept it. So if you do want a higher level of care for your loved one, you are going to be shelling out five, six, seven, eight, nine plus thousand dollars a month for your loved ones. And they won't be accepting that subsidy. Well, I love that you clarified that piece. Thank you for that. And well, well, now that we know the rates, how does someone even determine like what's a good market to invest in? How do they pick the neighborhoods? Could you shed some light on that? Absolutely. If you think about it, right, just because you turn 65 does not mean you're moving to Florida or Arizona, right? A lot of people age in place. If they grew up in Boston, they're probably staying in Boston. And so you definitely... Uh, we have a market everywhere because of the aging population. The baby boomers are starting to need this. It's coming about in the next 10, 20 years for most of them. And so we're going to see a massive influx of need. We're not building beds fast enough. We're currently 1.3 million beds short. And the population of the silent generation versus the baby boomers, it's just so drastic. And so there's definitely a huge need coming up and it's a huge need everywhere across the country. But if you were to say, I'm going to stay in my state, then location wise, I'm going to tell you, look for the area where the majority population is 50 to 70 years old, making twice the median income, who is a homeowner. That is going to really help you narrow in on the exact area where you want to put your assisted living home. That is not the senior living in your home. That's the adult child who's paying for the care of the senior living in your home. And we want to target them. They are the key to the market because they're the ones who make the decision on where mom or dad goes. They usually foot the bill. They usually are the POA. So they are the answer to it all. And that's who we want to target. Oh, that's interesting. So quick clarifying point then. You said 50 to 70 who makes twice the area median income. Yeah. Are we talking about the children of the folks that... of that 50, 70 that are making twice the area median income, not the elderly. Yeah. The, the, okay. So the, the 50 to 70 year old is the child of the elderly senior living in your home. So this is the adult child. The 50 to 70 year old is the adult okay. child. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. And I was like, oh, then they'd be like 30 years old then, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's, 70, yeah. that's really good to know that. And they have to be homeowners too, because chances are, they have a little bit more equity build. And I'm assuming that's just like their ability to pay. That's how you're filtering that. Yeah, it's more just typically a homeowner is going to be better well off than a renter in most cases. Not always, right? Grant Cardone likes to rent stuff, like not always. But in most cases, if you are a homeowner, you are probably a little bit more financially steady. And so that's a good indicator. When we have a large population of 30 and under and a lot of renters and a lot of people making less than the median income, that is not the area we want to be in. Avoid, avoid, avoid. Got it. So just to clarify, I was 50 to 70 years old, twice income, and we want half the population to be in that bucket? 
Did I catch up? I mean, the majority, we always say. So you want as large of a population Mm. of that area. And the reality is, is like if you searched Houston and did that, it's too, it's too big. We've got to really narrow it down to one small pocket. And this is where those people live. That's where we want the home. Got it. So you're being super sniper with this research. Oh, yeah. Just like hoping and praying. You're actually doing real, real research by area, by neighborhoods. I love, I love that. Yeah, it's I not if you build it, they will come. You have to make sure it is properly located. It's real estate investing at the end of the day. And if it's not properly located, it will not work. I've seen way too many people say, well, I have a property and I think I can make it work with that. But they didn't do the research and they're like, but it's seven bedrooms. Like, I'll make it work. But it is not located properly. And it's like, nope, that is the number one thing that you have to start with. Well, this seems like a great strategy. We've learned how much can you charge for rent. We've learned where to look. What sort of expenses are associated with residential assisted living facilities? Like what can people expect to incur for their operating expenses? Definitely 40% of your total expenses, sometimes even more up to 50% is going to go towards staffing. So you're not going to work in the home or live in the home and you're going to need to hire a licensed administrator and licensed caregivers to do that work. So most of your expenses are for your staffing. All the other expenses are the regular things that you or I may have in our own home. Cable, utilities, electric, food. Um, We also include things like the activities and things of that nature, maintenance, right? Uh, Maybe you have a private chef. And so that's another independent contractor that you're paying for. So all those different kind of regular things, you're going to want liability insurance that is above and beyond. It's about two to three dollars per day per resident. So 600, 900 bucks a month. Really, it's a line item, nothing to be worried about. But all your normal kind of rental and home expenses, plus the staffing, plus the food uh, and the independent contractors. And so for a 10 bedroom home, it could easily run around thirty thousand dollars Uh, a month in expenses uh, with 10 residents, it could be more. And I've seen people do it for a lot less. That is not including your debt service or mortgage. That would be on top of that. Wow. Well, it seems like you need almost what I'm calling is very technical people because you said you need an administrator, you need a licensed caregiver. Would those be sort of your most expensive folks on the payroll, Would in your opinion? Or is it things like the private chef? Chefs are actually very inexpensive. Um, there's a lot oh. of... Yeah, there's a lot of people who go to culinary school and they think when they graduate, you know, they're going to go get a job making like French cuisine and the only job is the local chilies. Uh, and they're like super bummed because they wanted to try their creations and express their talent and their skill. And so you can hire them. And uh, honestly, minimum wage, if not a dollar or two more, is kind of going rate right for private chefs at these care homes. They'll come over, do made to order breakfast, uh, usually cook something for dinner that can be heated up later and then do a lunch and they're out of there by noon. They may work only like six to noon. Um, So it's really not like a, like, what do you want? And they're there at your beck and call 24 seven, right? Um, They, they have their shift and they're probably working at the Chili's at night, but your licensed administrator and licensed caregiver, um, those are the people that you are spending the most money on because caregivers, you're usually having a four to one or five to one ratio. So with 10 residents in the home, you may have two to three caregivers on during the day. They're typically paid minimum wage plus a couple dollars an hour. There's a lot of different information where you can find online by searching what a caregiver makes in your area. Across the country, it definitely ranges from about 12 to $30 an hour, depending on where you live and what the rates are in your area. But two to three on in the day, one to two on at night. And then your administrator is a shared expense if you have multiple homes. If you only have one home, you're not paying them as much because it's not full time for them to oversee one home. Um, 80% of this industry is run by immigrants, people from other countries. So it's not like a person who went and got a four-year degree just to be a licensed administrator at this home. It's a simple uh, course or test that you can take typically online. Some states have in-person training that you can take. They get their stamp of approval and they're a licensed administrator. Wow. I never knew 
that these folks are just making minimum wage plus or minus like a few extra dollars. That almost seems a lot more inexpensive, I guess is the right word, than what I would thought. Because I was thinking like nursing salaries and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So that makes sense. Well, you mentioned that an administrator can, if it's just for one home, they're part time. What is sort of the capacity that you would expect from Mr. Can they take on two, three, four, five homes? Like, what does the team look like as people try to scale this operation? So just to set the tone, this industry is like the wild, wild west. There is no national regulations on residential assisted living homes. We actually created the only national association that represents all 30,000 group homes across the country, but there's no national rules. So some states did not have rules about how many homes an administrator could hang their license on, meaning they could either get paid to be hanging their license on it, or they could be actively managing it, like being the true manager of the home. So some states, right, you would have one manager who had their license on 500 homes. And clearly they cannot manage 500 homes, but they were just getting paid to hang their license and someone else would be acting as the administrator or manager within the home. And you may be paying them 500 bucks for that license and you're paying a caregiver $5 more an hour, right? And so you're saving money in that way. A lot of states have cracked down on this and now they limit you somewhere between three and six. Six is kind of the max I've seen. I personally, with almost every administrator I've spoken to, two to four homes is full time. So we highly encourage anyone starting in this industry to not just do one home, but do a three pack. Three homes within 20 to 40 minutes of each other. If that really is full time for your administrator and then your caregivers, you can share the staff between the homes because a caregiver works a 12 hour shift. So if they're working for you three or four days, that means they're off the other three or four days. They're not off. If you don't have another home, they're working at Joe Schmo's home down the road. If you have multiple homes, they can work three or four days for you here and three or four days for you over here. You're not paying overtime and they get to stay in the same work culture and environment. Wow. That's really interesting. I I never really thought about that. As an administrator, this sounds almost like your right-hand person when you're the owner operator are just give us some idea of like what the administrator actually does are they just kind of to catch all for anything that you don't want to do as an investor give us some more details about that they are hiring firing training uh retaining all of your staff so you're not in charge of any of that with your caregivers they are marketing a home building relationships with placement agents, geriatric doctors, um, hospice agencies, other local homeowners, um, and they are doing tours with the families when they come in. They're doing residency intake and making sure that their marketing leads to tours, tours leads to residents coming in. Uh, they are coordinating all of the activities, whether it's the chef or music therapy, pet therapy, senior yoga, you name it. They really are the lifeblood of the business. They do everything. You only own the real estate and own the business and maybe spend five hours a week doing some paperwork or payroll, something of that nature, checking in with your administrator, making sure that the roof isn't on fire. But really, they are doing it all. Wow. Wow. That is incredible. <laughs> For the salary that you mentioned, that almost seems like an all-star that someone is doing all that work because it's a blend of operations and administrative work. Do you do you help her? Like, I'm thinking about large businesses now, right? Managing KPIs and funnels and marketing. What do you do then as an investor? In your opinion, that might be the best role. What are you doing? Are you helping them look at, hey, how many leads came in and how many tours have we done? Are you looking at that so that you're managing the team effectively? I guess the better question is, how are you managing the administrators to make sure that they're doing their work? Yeah, I think if the beds are full and you're not having a lot of caregiver turnover, then that would mean that they're doing good, right? Most people run these very mom and pop. It's not professional like the way we run our other businesses with metrics, KPIs, and putting people on pips and all that good stuff, right? That's not what we do in this business. And they would be probably terrified if you even had those conversations with them. But... I don't think it's a bad thing to have those conversations. For example, with our administrator in the beginning, when you're working with anyone in business, I always tell people this, 
in the beginning, they're not going to be making any decisions without you. They're in this category, which is like, don't do anything. Ask me everything. And I'm going to tell you what I would do or what I want or whatever. And we'll make a protocol or we'll make a SOP around it or whatever the case is. As time goes on, you hope that they move into the next bucket, which is do it and tell me after right? And make that mistake. And hopefully you don't make the mistake. And I just get to say, good job. But if you did, we'll talk about it. We'll work through it. And we'll talk about what we would want to happen the next time. The final category, which is where you hope to get with every employee you ever have in any of your businesses is do it. And I don't even care. Like, I don't want to know because I trust you that much and you know exactly what needs to get done. So I'm to the point with my administrator where we're up there right? But it took a long time. We've been in the business for 10 years. It took a long time to get out of this box and move to this one and move to this one. And it could be the same thing with spending limits. It may be like, hey, anything over or anything under 200 bucks, I don't care. Just if you need it, go get it for the home. And then it's like, you know, anything a thousand bucks. Okay. Anything that, you know, you need to ask me like these different things. And so there's levels to it, but as you set up your protocols, your systems, definitely you will have policies and procedures. You have to, to get the home licensed. All those different things are going to help you build that relationship with your administrator so that they're running the business the way you want it to be done. But at the end of the day, they're the professional. You're an investor, an owner of, of real estate. What do you know about helping seniors and dealing with their families and dealing with caregivers. You don't, right? That's why you're hiring them for their expertise. And so I think to some extent, you don't want to micromanage them and tell them, you know, exactly what to do. You need to let them, you know, tell you what to do a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And I love that you have it so structured where you have the decision matrix for folks like yeah. hey, anything below 200 bucks. Let's not waste my time. I trust you enough. And it all comes down to hiring the right people and the best team. Yeah. Maybe this is a good time to ask this question. Like, what, what sort of personalities have you seen for administrators? Because it's such a crucial role. What have you seen in terms of personalities or traits that determine like who's most likely to succeed as an administrator? We actually survey. Um, all of our students and basically said, if you have an amazing administrator or caregiver, have them take the predictive index profile because we use that in our business. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's um, an amazing tool that we don't hire anyone without having them take it. And so we kind of got like the top 100 managers from across the country to take the test. And we found that there was four profiles that they all fell into. And so really it breaks it down to their leadership versus their collaboration, their sociability versus how reserved they are, their impatience and driving nature versus their patience and their steadiness, and then their risk tolerance. It also tells you if they make decisions more logically or emotionally. The test is extremely accurate. And if you take it as the business owner, we compare and contrast yours versus theirs and match someone who really fits you. But we have those four profiles that we work off of and all of our students who we work with um, at a at, at our platinum level, we have them, you know, have them take have have them have their administrators take those tests so we can make sure it's the right fit for them. But you're definitely looking for someone who is a leader, who is sociable, especially if you're having them doing tours, right? You you need someone. This is the face of your company. They have to be steady. Anyone in the senior housing industry who's going to be hands-on with seniors and their families must, must, must be patient and steady. Um, and then risk tolerance. I don't really want them super incredibly risk tolerant versus most of the investors are probably going to be extremely risk tolerant because that's the business that they're in. Well, I don't want them over there. I want them to be procedural and follow the rules that have been laid out. So I'm looking for someone a little bit more precise. So the test kind of tells you that and we've got those little things mapped out. And so it really gives us a great look and feel for exactly the right person, not only for the role, but for you as the investor, like who matches with you. Wow, that is probably the best answer I've heard when it comes to hiring. Because when I think about the world's wealthiest people, I think they're just building a team of team builders. That's mm -hmm. what it is at the very simplest core principle. Mm -hmm. And you just shared your ultimate guidance for how do you pick the people that are most likely to succeed. So you're not picking a personality that is so the opposite of what is required to succeed in this role. That is so important. And that that little tip right there 
multi-million dollar tip. I'm so certain <laughs> of that as well. Like you're just dropping so many gems here. Well, how else do you, so now that we know how and who to hire, well, how, how, where do you even find these folks? Because I keep hearing about this big labor shortage. Like, how are you looking for these roles for the administrators and caretakers? We're actually seeing a lot of community colleges adding uh, administration and that role for care homes into their curriculum. So, so there will be some community colleges that you'll be able to put your home on a list of like, hey, when they graduate, give us a call. Like we're always looking for amazing new people. And so you may have an internship program that you want to set up where they come work with you, you know, at certain, certain pay rate, right. And, and you're getting, they're getting experience and you're getting to, you know, have some work in your home. You also can go to different online ventures like Indeed, LinkedIn, Craigslist, all these different places. And then there's even more niche ways to go about this here in Arizona. And every state is different. But here in Arizona, majority of our caregivers are Romanian or from the Philippines. And so we find a lot of people um, find us through targeted ads in the local Romanian or Filipino newspaper. We put an ad written in English, say that we're looking for a caregiver and this is what we're paying. This is the location they'll reach out to us. Um, it's definitely a relationship-based industry. So when you get one amazing caregiver, they probably have a friend, family member, whomever, who also wants to come work. So once you start and get your core team locked in, they'll have referrals for you. Um, but I think all of those are great ways to kind of get started. And then once you're over the bridge, relationships. Wow. Wow. Well, maybe just one question there to dive a little bit deeper. You mentioned those community colleges. As an investor, you might have this fear, right? This is what investors do. They always fear, worst case scenario. What if I hire someone that's too green, right? They might fit the personality. What can they do? Can, is there or do you have procedures in your program that says, hey, pick up this book and just do it? But then get back to me. You have any questions? Like, how do people manage and balance the level of risk with a newer person versus trying to figure out how to hire a more experienced administrator, but they might be a little bit harder to find. Definitely. I am also on page with you of saying I have hesitation in anyone hiring someone who is fresh, fresh into this and they've never wiped a bum. They've never, you know, actually physically helped someone get up and walk to the other room. You really do need experience in this and you need to know if that's where your heart lies. So you, uh, when you're first hiring, right, I would definitely hire on, especially an administrator who has experience. We've never hired on a brand new administrator, but it doesn't hurt to put your name on those lists to say, we have an internship program, so you can come and be an assistant administrator in the home. They're maybe working as a caregiver or doing some light tasks or whatever the case is. So you can work that out. But one thing that we always do, especially with our caregivers, is a four hour working interview. So we have them come over. They do the actual verbal interview. We sit down, get to know them. And if we want to take it to the next step, we tell them, bring clothes. You're okay getting messy in right? Bring sneakers or closed toed shoes or whatever the case is. And they're not legally allowed to go, you know, white bums or do anything like that just yet. But then after the interview, we say, great, I want to take the next step. And that's a working interview. So we're going to put you on the floor and see how you interact with the seniors, the other staff, whoever it may be. After, you know, a day in the home, they may be like, this is not for me. Like once they see what it actually is, and that is okay. This takes an extremely special person. Uh, with the growing need of the coming silver tsunami, there is going to be a huge crisis in the shortage of caregivers. I'm not going to deny that. We need more amazing caregivers. Not everyone has the heart for this, but with everything getting automated in our worlds these days, you know, we don't need as many people working at McDonald's because we can tip tap to 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 and the burger comes out. Right. So I don't need to interact with anyone anymore. That job won't exist in five, 10 years. But you know what will? A, a machine can't wipe grandma's bum. A machine can't, you know, bathe her, cook her food, help her out of a chair, spend time with her, interact with her. Those jobs will exist. And the reality is we're all getting older or know someone who is. So this is not going away. And there's not going to be the jobs that once existed when we were younger, when our parents were younger. They're not going to exist anymore. What is going to exist? Caregiving jobs. 
jobs as medical professionals. That's not going away. So we're going to see a shift where if you want a job, you may have to do something in this field. I'm so impressed by how you address that fear of hiring the wrong person with a working interview. <laughs> this That's so good because I, I used to be an EMT. I did that for five years uh, in the greater Boston area and answer 911 calls. I remember sometimes we would have folks that are brand new EMTs, but they would be the third rider. They would ride along to get some experience and some of them were afraid of blood. Yeah, I was like, you can't be an EMT if you're afraid of blood. That just doesn't work. <laughs> so in this scenario, you can't be a caretaker if you're afraid of helping people. And it might be mind-blowing, but you got to touch the person every once in a while to help them with things. You got to do it. So you got to be prepared for all these roles. So not only did we address your fear of, hey, how do I make sure I'm hiring the right person, knowing where to find it, but then also creating your people strategy, which is what Isabel was referring to. How do you develop your team so that you can continue to grow your team of all-stars as you continue to scale? That internship idea, that's great. It's going to be really hard to find great administrators. So you have to start picking them up from the earlier part of the hiring process in the pipeline through the community's mm -hmm. college. I love that. It's, but that is so, so genius. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll even say this, right? Uh, you know, we mentioned in the beginning, I just had my son, he's two months old. And as I was interviewing, you know, nannies, obviously you're looking for someone who has experience. It's very similar, right? Childcare and, and elder care. But in some circumstances, I would be interviewing someone and they would say, well, my past family did X, Y, Z. Well, my past family, X, Y, Z. When you get an administrator who's really stuck on how it was run at another facility or another home, that's also not a good fit. So just because someone has experience doesn't mean that they're the right one. A lot of people have a medical professional or someone in their life who, you know, is tired of being a nurse or wants to retire and maybe wants to make a shift. So they have experience in the medical field, but not in this capacity. And so when you partner up with them and make them your administrator, you guys get to start from the beginning. You get to build from the beginning. What policies do we want in this home? What SOPs do we want in this home? What's the culture? What's the core values? What are we building in this home? And you get to kind of do it together. So there's pros and cons, but I do think if you're going to hire someone brand, brand, brand new, you've got to see how they actually interact for sure. Oh, that is so good. Well, how... Before I want to get eventually get to like a case study with all the numbers and everything, but I love that we're covering all of the qualitative information right now because now in my head, well, how if I were to pick up a property today, how difficult is it to get a license to operate a residential assisted living in? Who do you need to hire to help with that? Great question. You don't need to hire anyone to get a license. You just need to search the rules and regulations in your area, and then you will just abide by those, basically. So every state has a website. Usually it's your DHS, Department of Health Services website. Um, and in that, home, in, in, in that, you know, site, it's going to tell you exactly what you need for your home to be licensed for this. The state will usually say somewhere between 80 to 100 square feet per person. I shared with you earlier that our rule of thumb at RAL Academy is 300 to 500 square feet per person because we don't teach people to do the minimum. We teach people to go above and beyond, do luxury, do something you could be proud of, do something where they walk in and they say, wow, I will want to live here, right? Because that's the place they want to put their mom or dad. So um, your state will have requirements. They're going to be disgustingly low and you're going to be freaked out when you read them. But I'm going to always encourage you go way, way above and beyond. Your state has paperwork. You can literally Google it and find it right now. You fill it out, name, address, location, you know, how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, you apply. Some states, the application is a six month waiting process. Others, it's like 30 days. It's totally all over the place. We give lots of tips and tricks on how to make it go faster in our live training. Um, there are students have used that we have used to really make it better. I, I always thought you needed like a lawyer and licensing expert to get this stuff, but it seems a little bit more simple than that. Maybe yeah. in terms of a sequencing question then, if you're just buying a home, right? When do you get these process started? Do you start the application process as soon as you buy the home and you're doing all these renovations? And when do you actually get the administrator involved? Because the administrator can probably give you some ideas like, hey, 
the way you're renovating this property probably isn't very functional for what you're about to do. So just curious to your thought process on how do you prioritize the sequencing of this work between the rehab, getting and applying for the license and hiring an administrator for the property? Great question. And it's definitely a bit of chicken before the egg, right? With licensing, with renovating and the administrator. So for us, what we did was we hired an administrator, like as soon as we had identified and locked down a property that we knew we wanted to do this with, we kind of did those simultaneously. And we hired the administrator, they were working somewhere else, we said, keep that job, but we want to hire you over here when this is up and ready. So we're going to pay you a small fee right now to basically lock you in to get your loyalty. That will not work with everyone. That's what works with us. I'm just telling my personal experience of, of what happened. So you have to do whatever's right for you, but you were right on the money with saying you have to ask them about the functionalities of the home because the renovations, they may have very strong opinions about, no, we actually need this or we need that or utilize this. But also in our training, we offer mentoring and coaching, and that's exactly what we do. We go through the home with you. We show you what to avoid, what to look for. So if you don't have someone like an administrator who has that experience or knows what to do, you know, coming and working with someone like us is, is an, the next best thing. I'll tell you that. But in general, once you get the home, you're going to want to apply for the license pretty much right away because that process can take a while. And so obviously it's not going to be converted right away. So you're applying for it, but it is kind of all happening at the same time. Once you get that license, the fire marshal comes over, gives you the stamp of approval, and then you're good to go accepting residents uh, legally through the state. Wow. That is, thank you for that tip. Cause that's a hot tip. Cause usually that's when people don't understand what steps they need to take, then they start again with the whole idea behind fear and like, I don't know what to do. So now you at least know, Hey, just take one step before the next and just yeah. hire an administrator yeah. and ask Isabel and her team on what you should do. Yeah. Well, Isabel to kind of, bring it all together do you have a deal that you can share with us in terms of purchase price what you pay for a down payment your renovation your income and expenses are you able to share a deal and any of sure. the details associated with, with us sure we bought a uh let's see it was a five bed five bath for 4800 square feet home for four hundred ninety thousand dollars here in arizona we put about a hundred K in renovation in it. And we also had about 60 K of carrying and startup costs. I always recommend people have at least two times their monthly expenses in carrying costs because you are not going to be full day one. So you need to budget um, for that. If you do things right, when you open, you will have residents moving in right away. But that means you started marketing way yesterday, right? So you've got to do it properly. That 5-5, five, five, we actually added two bathrooms, four bedrooms. So it's a, what is that, a 9-7 a now. It's still the same 4,800 square feet. We converted the front dining room into a bedroom. We, there was a huge, great room that we converted um, into bedrooms, bathrooms, and a family room. And so we actually even filled in the pool. Um, and so that home brings in rates of about $5,000 per resident. Uh, there's 10, I haven't done the math on this one in a minute. So there's 10 residents in the home, 50,000 coming in every month. Expenses on that 10 bedroom home run right around 30. Um, and our debt service on that one is about seven. So that home is bringing us in right about $13,000 of, you know, income there every month. Your goal is always to retain 20 to 30% of gross income. Um, and that's what should be falling to the bottom line. And that's kind of a, a, a relatively normal home example on what you could do with this. Wow. So setting aside or netting 20 to 30% of the gross revenue, are you setting aside any for reserves or maintenance? Like what does that look like on these types of properties for maintenance? Yeah, I mean, when you're doing your renovations, you're going to want to update as much as you can. So mm -hmm. if this home needs new AC or roof or this or that, you need to do all of that. You want to get it as fresh as possible. Um, but you do, there there are expenses. And so maintenance is a line item in expenses that you're setting aside every month. And if you don't use it, you don't use it. 
but you have it if a pipe bursts or something of that nature. So um, all of that money for expenses, whether it is spent that month in particular or not, it's put into kind of your reserves saving up for if and when it's needed. But that 60K in carrying cost is two times the monthly expenses, right? So that kind of helps you as you're not going to be full day one. And so you still have a lot of expenses, but you're still building up that income. And so it takes a while to get that home full. But after about I would say six to nine months, you should be full with residents. If you've done your marketing properly, if you haven't, it may take you years to get your home full. We have students who do not listen to us and they do not do what we say to do. And it takes them years. And that reserve goes real quick. And then they're like, well, I'm in the red. I'm in the red. Well, you didn't do what we told you to do. Like it is vital that you market. You have to market your buns off to fill this home. <laughs> wow. So it's not a set it and forget it. You got to yeah. market it. What are the most, I guess, effective marketing strategies that you've seen for these types of units? Because these numbers are great, but that's assuming you did the work to execute on it. Exactly. So what sort of best practices do you have for marketing your properties? I could name 150 things right now that I'll tell you to market, but the top things you're going to need is you want a presence, right? Nobody can find you if you don't have a presence. It sounds silly, but you need brochures, you need business cards, you need a Facebook page, you need a website. You'd be shocked at how many homes don't even have a website, literally don't have a website. And if you don't have a sign out front, you look like a regular home. So how am I supposed to know who you are or, or what service you provide? brochures and business cards. It sounds old school, but if I'm going to a church and I'm talking to the pastor and I'm saying, Hey, we own a home down the street that, you know, if you have one of your, you know, congregates, one of your members who comes to you and says that their parent is struggling and needs assisted living, you know, here's our information. You can't just tell them go to ABC assisted living.com. Like he's going to forget that she's going to forget that you have to give them something that they can then give. So hard copy, online presence. And then lastly, a huge key to filling your home quickly is working with local placement agents. It's an entire industry of people, somewhat like a realtor, who when your loved one falls and breaks their hip or goes to the hospital and the doctor says they cannot go home alone, you start working with a placement agent and you'll tell them what amenities, what price point, what location you're looking for, and they will tour you through different homes and facilities. Now, which it costs you nothing as the family or the senior, but whichever home you choose, that placement agent has a contract with them. So if you're the RAL owner and they had a contract with you and they choose, you know, the family chooses you, you now owe that agent either a half of the first month's rent or the full first month's rent, depending on what contract you signed with them. If you do owe them the full first month's rent, you need to change the contract before you sign it to say, I'll pay half on month one and half on month two. No, don't give away your whole first month's profit, but it is really important to work with the local placement agents because they will fill your home a lot faster. And yes, you're paying for it, but I would pay all day to have a resident who's staying with me for an average of three and a half years. Like it's a no brainer. Oh yeah. That makes so much sense. And placements agents sound so critical. How, how do you even know if they're a good placement agent? Are they sort of like realtors where you know there's so many realtors and you don't really know which one to pick? Like how, how do you filter out whether they're a good placement agent? When you do your open house, you'll invite everyone in the assisted living community. And like we kind of talked about earlier, like you don't get into this industry if you're a slimy person. This isn't the pawn shop business, right? It's seniors, it's people's lives, and it's so, so important. So reputation is everything in this business. As you start in this industry, it doesn't matter if the home down the street is competition to you. They're your new best friend because they know everyone and they have the relationships and they have the business that you want. And so you need to befriend them. When you're full, you want to send people their way. When they're full, they'll do the same for you. So placement agents are the same. You want to build those relationships with them. You want to get to know them. And if you're working with them and they give you a weird or bad vibe, don't sign the contract. It's very very simple. You're only choosing to work with who you want to work with. But I'll also say this, it's not a tenant landlord agreement. You do not have to accept every senior into your home. You are allowed to say, no, it's not the right fit. 
and not accept them. And so in that case, even if the placement agent brought someone over and you're like, that's not the right fit, you have the choice to say, no, this is totally different than rentals. Like we are a protected class. It's a totally different ballgame. Wow. And I love essentially what I just took away from that is people just need to stop overthinking but then also collaborate. That was what I really pulled out from there because sometimes you might view them as competition, but guys, like collaboration happens at the top. Competition only happens at the bottom. And that's what I've been emphasizing to other people. You might have a great plumber. You should share that with other people just because that if you're helping the plumber grow his business, guess what? They're going to take care of you. And you're also building goodwill with other people. So I've seen folks where they're like, oh no, this, this, this contractor is mine. If I give it to you, then they won't do my job. <laughs> Come on, guys. Like, that's not the abundance mindset. No. Please share your resources with one another. And I love that we just got through some pitfalls on the marketing side. What other sort of pitfalls or mistakes do you typically see people make during the renovation side, Isabel? Oh, not maximizing bedrooms and bathrooms. You want as many bedrooms and bathrooms as you're allowed to have, right? And so if you're allowed to have 16 residents, you want, you know, 14, 15, 16 bedrooms. And so sometimes when you're doing those renovations, you'll be thinking like, oh, well, I, I was going to do an, a second, you know, this, or I was going to do a huge uh, salon or something like that. And it's like, if that could be an extra bedroom, that's where the money should be going. So maximizing bedrooms, bathrooms is key. And then overdoing the amenities. The reason someone is coming to an RAL is, is usually because they had a terrible experience at a big box facility. It's the 80-20 rule. I'm not saying that every big facility is terrible, but I'd say 80% are. I mean, it's really, really bad in the commercial assisted living facility world. And I'm not okay with it. You shouldn't be okay with it. No one listening should be okay with it. There is a lot of abuse, a lot of neglect. COVID shined a huge light on that. And thank God for that because we've been saying it for ages, but no one's listening because we're the small guy and, and no one even knew we existed. And then boom, now COVID happened and people are begging at our doors to let them come in. And so you don't need the huge chandelier. You don't need the salsa dancing room and the pickleball court and the huge you know pool in the backyard. The senior isn't using that. It hurts for them to get out of bed, let alone go play pickleball. That's for daughter Judy. That's for the adult child. They come into the facility and say, oh, I would love that. I would play here. I would do this. I would do that. Mom's not doing that. She's moving into assisted living for a reason. It's because it hurts for her to get out of bed, right? So in your home, making sure you're choosing amenities that match what the seniors can do. They match their abilities. The biggest and hottest amenities is salons. And I'm not talking a big one. I'm talking a small uh, you know, area where it has the chair and you can lean back in the, you know, the little tub. And so they can get their hair washed, feel nice and fresh and clean. Maybe the ladies can get their nails done or a little pedicure, something like that. Salons are a huge hit. And then secondarily, I would say movie theaters. Those are like the two biggest things. Things. And so movie theater doesn't even have to be very big either. It's a bunch of, you know, lazy boys in there or those nice, you know, chairs that they can kind of relax in and you put a big massive screen in a room. And so maximizing sp uh, space with the bedrooms, bathrooms, and then choosing your amenities wisely. Wow. I, I think that's so great that you mentioned all those things because I think people do tend to over renovate or they project their own wants onto mm -hmm every single house like you mentioned the pickleball court world's hottest you know growing sport everybody wants to do this but you got to understand your clientele so i want you have given so much value today isabel and i want to probably end this with just asking you okay for everybody have that has heard everything i said like this is absolutely the right way what sort of like options or strategies can they get involved can what if someone doesn't want to buy the house and operate everything, right? Are there different options for people to pick how they want to get involved in this? Yeah, actually, we teach and train people to do three different options. So one is to own the real estate and lease it to an operator or an operations company who's going to run the business within your home. So you would buy a home, you'd renovate it, add the sprinklers, fire suppression, you know, ramps, guardrails, handrails, add those bedrooms and bathrooms, smooth, clean floors, wide hallways, you name it, you're adding it all. 
and you're going to lease it to someone ready to go who's going to run the business within your home. You could be making twice the fair market rent. They're, they are a long-term low-impact tenant that requires little or no maintenance. Like You are not in charge of the maintenance. They're going to be, and they're not signing a one- or two-year lease with you. It's usually three, five, eight, or ten years. So that's one way you can get involved. Second, the most profitable and what we do and what we show most you know people to do because that's kind of where you control it all is to own the real estate and operate the business. So when I'm telling you, you know, we're making that 10 I, in our example, that specific home, 13,000, that's because we own the real estate and operate the business. The third way to get involved is to be a private lender or JV partner. So if you're an accredited investor and you want to invest in someone who's looking to do one of these deals, the deals could be ranging from 300K to 3 million, right? They're probably not going to be over three and a half. That's probably the top top end. Um, but most people are looking for definitely more than maybe your typical investor who's just saying, here's 50, here's 100. They're probably looking for more than that. And or they're going to have to do a syndication or something of that nature where they have multiple investors. So if you are an accredited investor and want to be a private lender on one of these deals, coming to the training or the national convention or going into you know different groups like our national association, you can network with other people who are looking to do this and invest in them. And you're just getting your return and you don't own the real estate and you don't own the business. So that's kind of the three best ways to get involved. Wow, and I love that. So, and I think this is probably the part where I'll ask the listeners, say, be really clear about your strengths. And if you just want to be the person that owns a real estate but manages a rehab, but you don't want to operate a business, it's a completely different beast to manage folks. So just be really honest with yourself and don't try to bite off more than you can chew. And reach out to Isabel. Isabel, where can people find out more about you and your team and your RAL Academy program? Yeah, uh, RAL101.com is a great place to go to grab a ton of free information. We've got books, webinars. You can schedule a call with me or one of the team members. And we are actually relaunching um, our podcast, which is the Assisted Living Network. We should be relaunching it coming up middle of March. So um, make sure to check that out, the Assisted Living Network, for other free fun tips uh, and follow us there. I love it. Isabel, this has been such a pleasure and I and I can't thank you enough because you're creating great homes for great people and treating them with pride and dignity. And I think this has really opened up my eyes, not just the audiences, to a whole world of other opportunities. And for that, I'm so grateful. Thank you so much for coming on today, Isabel. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. All right. And we're out. And for those folks that have more questions, make sure you follow Isabel and leave a comment below.